to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The anointed of God, who has blessed us once again to congregate for a further investigation of the Word of God. We hope, trust, and pray that as we study the doctrine of Sosterology, which is the doctrine of human redemption commonly called salvation, that as we study from the overall theme of is your faith tried or fried, that we might be looking at a theme that really seeks to give us an understanding of that which is found recorded and written upon the pages of inspiration. Last night, we looked at the subject, a perfect faith. And we hope, trust, and pray that your perfect faith today has been what it should have been since the beginning of your travel with the Lord. On this occasion, we want to look at the writing of James as it refers to a faith that saves. We hope that we may lend to your comprehension the greatness of the salvation that God offers, the price that was paid for that salvation, which in essence brought our redemption, our reconciliation, and our justification, and that we might be able to receive it with meekness and with joy. In our text tonight, we have some social and spiritual implications of the language that James uses to help us understand the magnitude of our salvation. I want to thank Michael Peavy for his sacrifice to bring us back to Chicago yes, so that we might be able to share with you some things that we may have learned from the study of God's word. I want you to know that it's always a pleasure to be among those whom I have labored with and whom throughout the years I have enjoyed our fellowship with. To those of you who have supported this endeavor with both your presence, your prayers, and your encouragement, I want to thank you for your sacrifice. I know that we are living in those times when coming to church is now a chore more than a privilege. And I'm still here to tell you, it is always a privilege to be in the house of the Lord with the people of God. Now, I'm not going to keep you too long tonight because I learned from one of the great pioneer preachers of our brotherhood that in order to be profound, you did not have to be eternal. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to be profound without being eternal. Our subject for tonight comes to us from the text of James chapter 1 and verse number 21. We're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will record for us a passage of scripture that is inculcated with raw language and sometimes may be considered offensive, vile, and foul to some. Yet because James is writing by plenary and verbal inspiration, we must accept and seek to understand his usage of the terms that he uses. By verbal inspiration, we understand that to mean that which is spoken. In other words, words that are used to convey the thoughts of the spokesman or the author. James, throughout his book, 
will use concrete language that one may understand what it is he seeks to convey to the redemptive society of God. By plenary, we are saying that the words conveyed is that which is full, complete, absolute, and unqualified. In other words, the author is using thoughts that did not originate in his mind per se, but is given to him by a source much greater than he is. It is given to him by the external internal power of God, and the author merely expresses those things that God has put on his mind in words so that you and I might be able to comprehend and to understand what God is seeking to convey to humanity. Here in this text, James will encourage the believer to lay aside or put down some things that hinder the walk of the believer. James is in actuality seeking to encourage the believer of their response to so what that justification, sanctification, glorification, and consummation will be realized with inextricable joy. In other words, if anybody ought to have joy in their lives, it ought to be a child of God. It ought to be a member of the redemptive society of God. If anyone ought to be silly happy, Gene, it ought to be those of us who obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. If anyone ought to have a smile on their face, it ought to be a member of the redemptive society of God. James will seek to encourage you to lay aside something, but not just lay it aside, but also to receive something. What we ought to receive ought to be both impacting and demonstrative. He will give the believer the concept of how he is to receive what he wants us to comprehend. That is, that the believer must learn to accept attitudinally something that will lead him to be secure in his rescue and in, his fa and in the fact that he has been returned to the proper place where he belongs. In other words, when you look at the background of what James is seeking to convey, we need to understand that the believer needs to recognize that he needs a saving faith. When we think about the saving faith, we need to recognize that James wants you and I to continue to be saved. In other words, if somebody wants you to continue to be saved, then there is the possibility and the probability that you can lose that which you have been so freely given. Notice that in the context, James will point out that the sinner man was brought forth by the will of God, by the word of truth, verse number 18. Notice that James pleads for the believer to be swift, that is with rapid speed, to hear the word of God and to be slow, listen to me, and to be slow to what? To speak and slow to wrath. In other words, make sure that you are in control of what you understand before you speak and before you explode. Wrath has two words with two different meanings of action. The words are all gay and tumors. These are natural impulses. These are natural desires. And these are natural dispositions. They're, these come to denote anger 
as the strongest of all passions. Orge suggests a more subtle abiding condition often with a view towards revenge. Let me say that again. Anger can lead to revenge. And there are a lot of members of the body of Christ who are full of revenge seeking. You and I need to understand that it is God who will ultimately pay the price for our disposition. Notice what he says. Tumos suggests the sudden explosion of anger, but just as suddenly as it explodes, it subsides. In other words, you get it out of your system and you are through. James, however, wants you to understand that the anger and the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So James, in our textual context, calls for the believer to put some things down or away from him. The word lay down metaphorically means to put down and take off. It was used to describe what the Jews did when they were getting ready to stone Stephen. They took off the garments so that the garments would not impede and stop them from stoning our first brother martyr. In other words, James is letting you know that there are some things that will impede your progression of salvation. James wants you and I to understand that there are some things that you need to lay aside. There are some things that you need to get rid of. There are some things that you better put aside because if you don't put it aside, it will not work the righteousness of God and that which does not work the righteousness of God brings the wrath of God down upon us. And we need to recognize, beloved, that God is a God of indispensable justice. And it does not matter who you be or what you be. If you are not working the righteousness of God, then you are working the devil's bedevilment and you are in cahoots with the devil. Hello, you and I need to understand that James is getting ready to be insulting. And I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it tonight because I am just saying what James is saying. So if you got a problem with my language tonight, that's between you and James. Don't get mad at the postman. He just brings the mail. And that's all I'm doing tonight. James says, lay aside all filthiness. The word filthiness in antiquity was a word that was used to describe done. Feces, hello, garbage, that which is excrement. And when you look at what James is saying, James is not trying to be nice. And he's trying to let you know that there comes a time in everybody's life when you got to get rid of some crap in your life in order for you to be able to understand the word of God. Beloved, sometimes crap will creep up on you and will hinder you from making everything God has given to you possible. And so James says, listen, get rid of the crap in your life so that you might be able to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Too, much, uh, too many of us got so much crap in our lives that we cannot hear the word of God. We cannot embrace the word of God. We cannot accept the word of God. And so we turn to tradition. We turn to things that don't matter. And we make what don't matter matter and what matters don't matter. James says, lay it aside. Get rid of that stuff. And receive with meekness. But he also says, not only get rid of the filthiness, but get rid of the superfluity of naughtiness. And what he's letting you understand, that just because you are a child of God, does not mean 
that you are you are detracted from the moral filth, the moral defilement that spoils your garment, that stains your garment, that causes you to stink, that causes you to smell, that causes you to be separated from your redemption. Therefore, lay it all down. Put down anything that will cause you to have an ineffective salvation. In other words, put things out of your life that are not conducive to the progression of your faith where you become that which God wants you to be, where you are able to look at the future as if it is the present, that you are able to grab onto that which is unseen and act as if you are seeing it. Too many of us are living in the past, and 90% of church members are still in the past when they ought to be at least in the present. Forget the future, get into the present. And a lot of times the reason people are concerned the church isn't grown, the reason that the church is not grown is because we're stuck in the past. We need to recognize that if anything, we need to move into the present so that we can get ready for the future. And a lot of times, beloved, we are so prone to be in the past that we think that if you adapt to the future and the present, you have denied the word of God. I'm here to tell you that the word of God is adaptable to any situation. Hello. Our biggest problem is that we think that we still live in Jerusalem. A lot of us still think that Gamal is a member of the church. Gamal got some cousins in the church. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just dealing with the text. Get rid of what? Wickedness, malice, evil. You got some evil folk in the church. James is just learning what Paul learned. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, Now I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. And if that comes from a man who was inspired, full of the Holy Spirit, what about us who don't even believe in the ghost? Oh, beloved, James says, you need to get rid of some stuff. Get rid of the crack. Hello. Get rid of the superfluity of northern. And the word superfluity means abundance. In other words, it's not just a little wickedness. It's a whole lot of it. Hello. We, you, know, you know, it's funny how we, we, we will get up and preach and beat up on folk. And then get up and say, we want to thank you for coming. And, 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 we, and, and we want you to come back next week. For what? Another beating? It's supposed to be about good news. It's supposed to be a redemption. It's supposed to be why God loves us. Listen, Jesus never had a problem with people being what they were. They were sinners. He knew that and he never condemned them for being sinners. He tried to help them. He tried to show them that there is a better way. And our job is to show people a much more excellent way. I don't need to be beating up on people. They know what they are. Hello. A homo, you ain't got to tell a homosexual he's a homosexual. He knows what he is. What you need to tell him is that God loves a homosexual. And that he needs to repent. And that he needs to obey the gospel. That's what you need to tell him. You ain't got to chastise him because he's a homosexual. He knows what he is. Hello. What we need to do is teach in such a manner and perform in such a manner and make the atmosphere right where that person will see that he is wrong, that he is in sin, 
and that he needs Jesus in his life. Hello. Lay aside wicked. Now, 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 some of y'all are looking at me like you think that I'm just talking about morality. I'm talking about the way some of us think. How we have become so judgmental that we judge everybody except ourselves. Lay aside, James says, all superfluity, abnormalities, and receive. And the word receive means to ap approbation. Get it. Take it. Receive it. In other words, stop playing with it. And receive it. And put it to work in your life. Notice, he says, receive it how? With an attitude adjustment. Receive the word with what? Meekness. Meekness. One of the most beautiful words in all of the New Testament. Meekness is not weakness. Hello. Meekness is in actuality a word that was used to describe a wild stallion. A wild eagle who was caught, trapped, and domesticated and was brought under control. A stallion, is, am I, Sam, am I telling you the truth? A stallion that weighs 2,000 pounds is controlled by a bit in his mouth. And what causes him to be under control is the fact that that bit messes with his mouth and causes his mouth to get sore. And so when he gets sore, he's under control. He still has 200, he still has 2,000 pounds of raw power. Mess with him and you'll find out that the power has just been under what? Control. Meekness is nothing more than power under control. And because you have controlled your power, you put it under the control of God and the Holy Spirit. And when it comes time to get mad, you get mad at the right thing. You get, you get angry at the right thing. Many of us get angry for all the wrong reasons. A lot of us have what we call our own standards. And when someone passes us and messes with them standards, man, we're going to walk. Hello. We've raised our children to be angry. Yes, we have. We don't like the way they keep their rooms clean, and so we beat them up, and we talk about them, and we bash them. And the kid learns that he, he's not as important as the room. Hello. And then we wonder why when we say something to them when they're 18 years old, they look and say, you talk, who are you talking to? Uh -huh. yeah. And you too old to fight with that young Turk. <laughs> That's why you ought to keep a, a Smith and a Weston somewhere around. <laughs> Hello. And I got, I got scripture for that. In the Old Testament, you mess with your daddy, he could take you out and tell them elders to stone you. I'm so glad that our kids don't have to get stoned today, but they are ending up in jail and they're being killed by those men in blue. And we need to understand that a lot of that is our fault because of the way that we have raised them. Hello. James says, with meekness, Meekness is not weakness. Brethren, I've, I've raised five children and I had no problems taking none of them out. Hello. Well, you know, if you hit your child, he's going to call the cops. I told my kids, you call the cops on me, make sure your bag is packed. Because when, when I go, you got to go. And if I go, you can't come where I am. Hello. 
And a lot of parents are afraid. Listen, they can't put all of us in jail. Well, you know, I might go to jail. Go to jail if you have to. But don't be afraid and let the government tell you how to raise your child. Let me get back to this because y'all looking at me funny now. James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word. The word engrafted means a planting, an implanting. And there's another word that is used with that word which describes to grow. In other words, James says, receive the what? The growth word that will help you to produce a new leaf in your life. Your tree needs to have green leaves. Learn to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to rescue your soul, which is able to put you back where you belong. For salvation means to be put back in the place where I left. If you recall when God came into the garden and God said, Adam, where art thou? It was not because he did not know where Adam was. He said, Adam, you ain't where I left you. You out of place. And salvation means that God puts you back in place. You and I need to understand that we got three things in our lives. Number one, I am an emotional being. Number two, I am a spiritual being. And number three, I am a physical being. When I sin, I, when, I'm, when I'm those three things, I'm complete. But when I sin, I lose that component called spirituality. And all that marijuana, all that cocaine, all that alcohol, all that sex, everything is trying to replace what's missing in my life. And what's missing in my life is spirituality. And so when I come to Christ, he restores my spirituality and I now, according to Colossians chapter 2, become complete in Christ. I ain't missing nothing. I got all of it because God has reunited me and has made me whole again. And so I need to understand that. I need to recognize that I have come into that being where I am saved now by my conviction, my trust, my reliance, my dependency. And James now wants you to understand that as a child of God, you need help. We need help, brethren. We need help. And tonight, as I bring this lesson to a conclusion, I want you to understand what God has given us to help us to stay saved. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13 and 14. Preachers, here's your sermon for Sunday. In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession in to the praise of his glory. I want you to know that as a child of God, God has not only given you a guarantee, the guarantee is the Holy Spirit. And God has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. And I want to share with you the concept of the Christian being a sealed individual. As a sealed individual, I need to understand what it is that the Bible teaches a seal does. In antiquity, 
whenever you saw a seal, what you saw was something that was made out of metal, a cylinder, or a ring. In that ring particularly, you would have the name of the person who owned the ring. And it would be of such a manner that it would be taken and put into a soft substance and it would go down into that soft substance and when it came up, it would leave an impression in the wax. That impression was then applied to books, it was applied to letters, it was applied to loans, it was applied to anything that needed to be protected, needed to be shown who owned it, needed to be shown that there was authority for it, and needed to be recognized as identifying what it belonged to. Beloved, you and I need to understand that when God wants to know if you are saved, he don't ask the church secretary for your name. What he does is that he opens you up and he looks to see if he can see his spirit dwelling in your heart. Because in Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 6, he says unto us that because we are sons, God has sent forth his spirit into our hearts whereby the Spirit cries, Abba, Father, I'm here to tell you that if you want to know if you are a child of God, you need to make sure that the Spirit of God is dwelling within you. For I hear Paul writing an ode of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, God uses the Spirit to seal you. When God wants to know whose child you be, he looks to see if you got his spirit in you. And the way that he hears that is when the spirit cries out, my daddy, for Abba is the word that is used to describe daddy. That word Abba is not a Hebrew term, but rather it is a term that was used in antiquity to denote who my affection comes from. And we need to learn that God is my daddy. God is my father. God is my daddy. And when the Bible says you are a son of God, it's talking about your position, your possession, and your ability to be recognized that you are somebody unique in the sight of God. But when God says that's my child, now he's using a term of endearment. He's using a term of affection. And what he's saying is if you mess with my child, hello, you're going to have problems. Why? Because that's my child. Don't mess with my child. My, my possession is I'm a son of God. What that means is I am special. Now here's the, here's the beauty of being a son of God. Sons don't pay taxes. Sons don't pay taxes. Y'all looking at me like I ain't got no Bible. See, I know this is a church of Christ, so I know you got to have scripture. Turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 17, and you'll find where Peter said, what Jesus said, Peter, do the sons of the king pay taxes? I'm a son of the king. I don't owe the IRS nothing. <laughs> Even though I pay him. <laughs> I don't have to pay taxes. Hello. I've said that to simply say this. That because I am a child of God, God uses the spirit that is within me. Now, how does the spirit work in my life as a seal? Do you remember when jo Joseph was down in Egypt? And Jacob was in Palestine. And Jacob did not believe that Joseph was alive. And when Joseph revealed himself to his brethren, 
Joseph told him, y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for what? Good. And so I want you to know that, Je that, that Joseph put together a tremendous package of goods for Jacob. And he took those goods and he sent them with his brethren. And when those brethren got there, they went to talking to Jacob about the fact that Joseph was alive. And Jacob said, no, 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 no. You ain't fooling me. You ain't going to mess with me. But then the Bible says, and then Jacob saw the wagon. And he knew that his son Joseph was alive. Why? Because every wagon of a Pharaoh had the seal of Pharaoh on it. And you couldn't get those wagons unless you were somebody special with Pharaoh. And so when he saw the wagon, he identified the wagon. When God sees the seal in you, he identifies you as a bona fide child of his. Oh, you're, you're all missing your shout. Yeah, you missed your shout there. Let me tell you something. God has set his seal on this. And you and I need to learn that what God guarantees, God is able to provide in spite of the hell that we go through. Hello. We have a guarantee. And what God does is that he identifies us through the sealing of the spirit. Oh, there's some more stuff. This is some good stuff now. When you look at the sealing process, do you remember when they crucified Jesus? The Sanhedrin went to Pilate and they said, Pilate, we want you to protect the tomb because we don't want his disciples coming and taking the body and saying he got up. Pilate said, you got your own cortege of soldiers. Go and seal the tomb. The tomb was sealed to protect people from intruding into the tomb and what God does when he seals you when he seals me he's protecting us oh he's protecting us if you read the book of revelation you will find how that an angel is dispatched from the heavenly vestibules of heaven he comes down and he snatches satan and ties a chain around his sorry behind and casts him into a deep pit and then seals the pit telling you that Satan can't mess with you unless you go near the pit. Hello, God has limited Satan's ability to mess with his children. And the only time that he can mess with his children is when his children don't have the good sense to stay away from the pit. Man, I'm protected because God has given me his what? His seal of approval. I ain't got to worry about going to hell. I'm protected. And the beauty of being protected is that I'm not only protected from Satan, I'm protected from you. I'm protected from you. You got to understand, I can't lose with the stuff I use. See, a lot of us are always worrying about going to hell. I don't think about going to hell. I'm living in the now as if I was in the future and I'm walking with my God, my Lord, my Savior, and I'm holding on to his hand and wherever he leads me, that's where I will follow. Hello. 
I'm protected. A lot of times we act that God can't protect us. God has protected you by sealing. Listen, he identifies us. Remember in the book of Revelation when the four winds said, let us loose so we can destroy earth. He said, wait a minute. There are some folk down there that we got to seal. So that when I unleash the four winds of destruction, you will mess with them who got a seal on their forehead. I'm protecting my children. You see, God loves you so much that he was willing to turn his back. On his only begotten son. So that you and I could have eternal salvation. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? God turned his back on his son so that he could save you and I. He's telling you how much he loves you. He's given us the spirit. To let us know, I love you. I'm protecting you. As a matter of fact, I'm giving you all the authority you need. In the book of Esther, y'all are familiar with the story of Mordecai, Haman, and Esther. And how that Haman was a treacherous Negro. And how he was going to mess up with them Jews. And he got gallows built to hang O Mordecai. And so he went to Xerxes and said to Adic Xerxes, we got these Jews that are plotting to your downfall. We need to destroy them. So Adic Xerxes writes a letter and makes a proclamation and puts his seal on it that you're going to kill all them Jews. Well, Esther ain't had no problems doing wrong that's another sermon when I come back the next time I'll tell you about the wrong Esther does but Mordecai says to Esther what makes you think that if this thing goes down you ain't going down with it <laughs> you need to go talk to Adagruxes it was wrong for anybody to go talk to a Persian king unless he extended a septica. And so she, well, if I do that, he's going to kill me. You're going to die anyhow. <laughs> so what difference does it make if he kills you or the soldiers kill you? You better go talk to him. And so she goes and Xerxes says, well, what is it, honey? And she tells him, and she says, well, can you change it? I can't change it because once the law of the Medes and the Persian goes into effect, no one can change it. But I tell you what I will do. You write a letter telling the Jews that they can pick up their swords and defend themselves, and I will put my seal of authority on it. And when they see that seal, they have permission to pick up their swords and defend themselves. That, the Jews still celebrate that feast today. It's called the Feast of Purim. And I don't know about you, but God says I got all the authority to live like a child of his. I'm authorized to be a child of God. Hello. I don't know what it is about us that we are so afraid to be what God has told us we can be. Not only that, but if you recall in the days of Jeremiah chapter 32, God says to Jeremiah, I got a fella down south. And he's making noise in the south. Now, he comes from the north because he comes from out of Babylon. And him and his granddaddy, Nebuchadnezzar, have formed an alliance. And I got him coming up here to do some investigative work among these non-believing, no-good Jews. Hello. He so, said, well, Brother Lugo, where does the Bible say that? That's just my translation of what the Bible says. <laughs> and Jeremiah is told, you buy a piece of property, 
and make sure that you give it to Baruch so that when you come back from captivity, you will be able to reclaim your land. Well, back in that day, the temple had what was called a depository. It was a banking depository. And they had two things, an open deed and a closed deed. The closed deed was put in an earthen vessel and put in the temple depository. I want you to know tonight that you are that vessel. You are that vessel. And God has put his spirit in you. And that spirit in you in that earthen vessel says that when Christ comes again, he's going to open up that closed deed. And he's going to let out the deed that is in there, which is you and I. That's why no one who's a member of the body of Christ ought to worry about dying. That's good news. That's good news. There's only one way to get out of here. Really? <laughs> well, well, uh, well, when he comes, you're going to die. Because, see, death is nothing but a transition. And you cannot be afraid to make your what? Transition. Because God has given you the equipment to make you make the transition. And so I got the spirit of God within me. And I don't have to worry about you. I don't have to worry about you. I don't care what you say about me. I'm not concerned about your attitude towards me. You know why? Because I know who I am. And I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have committed unto him against that day. I have not committed nothing to you. But I have committed everything to him. And I know that I have a Savior who has saved me by my faith. And he's given me the seal of the Spirit so that I can be what he wants me to be. Not what you want me to be, but what he wants me to be. And so saving faith is a Christian responsibility. Even though a non-believer has to obey the gospel. James is talking to believers. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, Amen. Talking to believers. Yes. And a lot of times we want to talk to unbelievers when a lot of times we are the unbelievers. Yes. And I don't mean no harm by that. I'm just telling you that after 50 some odd years, I've come to the inescapable conclusion that we got a bunch of heathens in the church. Yeah, I did. See, we, we, we act that just because we got the name, we got the game. It takes more than a name on a marquee to make you the Church of Christ. The name Church of Christ is of no value if you cannot live like the Church of the Bible. If you cannot walk the walk by talking the talk and living the life, let me tell you something. All you are doing is putting on a show that don't matter to nobody but you. Saving faith is a faith that obeys the word of God. Saving faith is when I put all of my trust in him who died yonder on Calvary's cross for me. Saving faith is when I can give him approbation, when I can give him commendation, when I can say, Lord, you've summoned me to praise you, and I'm here to praise you, I'm here to glorify you, I'm here to have a hallelujah good time in your name. I don't know why it is that we in the church think that the more sorrowful we look, 
the more spiritual we are. I have never been able to understand how we can look like we're sucking spaghetti out of a Coke bottle and then tell the world, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. Ain't no joy. Listen, God has given you the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yes. We, are, we, are not, we are not slaves. We're sons of God. We're children of God. And we're so good for God that what God does is this. And I'm closing now. God says every six days after every six days. I want you to come up to my mountain. Yes. Because I want you to have a mountain top experience. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You've been going through hell all week long. You've been catching controversy. You've been catching conflict. You've been catching folk talking and murdering and assassinating your character. After six days, I want you to come up to the mountain and I'm going to meet you there in the garden. And what I'm going to do in the garden is I'm going to prune you. I'm going to fertilize you. I'm going to get rid of the weeds. I'm going to whack those weeds away from you so that when you go down off this mountain, you can tell the world, I've been with Jesus. I've been to the mountain top. I'm not here talking about what uh, our dear Baptist preacher said at, at, at there in Washington. I've been to the mountain top. I've not seen the glory of the Lord. I ain't been to that mountain top, but I've been to the one where I have seen the glory of God in my soul in my spirit and in my faith I know that there is a God I know that he is alive I know that he is a, not because I feel it in my heart but because I read it in the Bible I've seen his handiwork I know he is real and because he's real then I know that my faith in him is worthy someone said well you know preacher what happens that if you die and you find out that there is no God and then there is no heaven and he lost nothing? I ain't lost nothing. But what happens if there is and you have lived like there ain't no heaven, like there ain't no God? Now tell me what is it that you have lost? I ain't losing nothing by believing in a God that I can't see. That's why it's called faith. You see, when reason gets to the point where it can no longer be resolved, that's when faith says, move out of the way. And I accept what I cannot see. I accept what I cannot touch. I accept what people refuse to believe and I can accept the fact that my God is alive. And so I trust him. I put my faith in him. I give him all that I have. And if he happens not to be real, I ain't lost a thing. Now I ain't gonna lie to you. If I find out tomorrow that he ain't, bye. <laughs> I ain't going to tell you that lie that some of us tell in the church. If I found out tomorrow that there was no God, I would continue living, like, living the Christian life. Not me. The reason I live the Christian life is because I'm looking for something. I'm looking for my reward. And if he ain't there, ain't no reward. 
And if there ain't no reward, ain't no sense in being sacrificial. Hello. Well, you know, I would continue to live the Christian. No, you stop lying. You have a hard time doing that now. I mean, isn't it odd how difficult it can be to live the Christian life and yet is the only alternative that humanity has? You're here tonight, and you don't have a saving faith. You need one. You need a faith that will carry you through, that will allow you to go through hell, because God is more concerned about your character than he is about your comfort. And God will take you through hell. He won't leave you there, but he will take you through hell to straighten you out. And that's why the, the theme... Is your faith tried? Can you go through hell and come up on, on the other side smelling like a rose? I know some of you have been through that. Some of you can testify. Ain't no testimony without a test. Hello. So you're here tonight and you've been through some stuff and you're looking for prayer, you're looking for comfort, you're looking for someone to pray with you. You're at the right place. Let's pray together. Amen. All of us need prayer. Amen. I need prayer. Amen. Some of y'all say, I, well, he needs to repent because of the languages. I told you, that was James. That wasn't me. <laughs> you know? See, so, some of you couldn't stand the real Bible know-how. But that's another sermon. You're here tonight, and you need Jesus in your life. Just because you are a Christian does not mean that you don't have issues in your life. Amen. And Jesus can solve your issues.